You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Welcome to the Options Playbook, the program where we break down cutting-edge option strategies and explain how you can incorporate them into your own portfolio. Whether you're looking to grow your capital with some offensive maneuvers or protect your investments with defensive plays, you can find them all in the Options Playbook. The Options Playbook is brought to you by Ally Invest. Anything mentioned today is for educational purposes and is not a recommendation or advice. Options involve risk. Please refer to ally.com slash invest slash disclosures to review additional risks involved with trading options. Securities offered through Ally Invest Securities, LLC, member FINRA, and SIPC. Now, let's open the playbook and get started. All right, everybody, that music means it is time once again for Options Playbook Radio, the program here on the old network where we break down the sometimes scary world of options into offensive and defensive plays that you, too, can utilize in your own portfolios. My name is Mark Longo from the theoptionsider.com, as well as, of course, from the aforementioned network. Pleased to be subbing in here again on the old OPR, a.k.a. the Options Playbook Radio program. But if you're saying to yourself, wait a minute, he's not the usual guy on this show, you are correct, keen-eared listener. So let me introduce now your regularly scheduled co-host, Mr. Brian Overby, the senior options analyst, a.k.a. the options guy over there at Ally Invest. Brian, welcome back to your own show, sir. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And I always love when you and I can get together because that means we get to address these hundreds of uh, listener questions. And that means that we're going to huddle up. It's time to huddle up and answer questions about your favorite options plays. Submit your questions via twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or questions at the options insider.com. All right, everybody, let's get to it. The mailbag overfloweth despite Brian and my best, best efforts to, to pale it out. It continues to fill up, which, hey, good questions, good problems. Keep them coming. We love to hear from you guys. Let's see how many we can get in today. First off, Marival. Marival wants to know what are your thoughts about selling strangles at the one standard deviation levels of a particular stock? I know Brian, our audience. I think we had a question recently about one standard deviation as well. People have one standard deviation on the brain these days. All right, let's see. The, he goes on to write, uh, sort of like a Bollinger Band strangle. Thoughts on this technique? Is it me, or are there, are there new techniques for selling strangles all the time that always tend to blow out? Uh, aren't you better off selling uh, an iron condor or perhaps an iron butterfly due to limited risk? Well, yeah, first off, naked strangle selling. I don't think we've ever come out here and really advocated that <laughs> offhand. Uh, you know, that we definitely prefer the more risk mitigated approach, the iron condor. I'm an iron butterfly myself, but hey, to each your own, maybe like a traditional fly, like Brian, maybe a bit of a skip strike fly. All of those have the wings to protect you against the extreme adverse scenario. So your risk is mitigated at the outset. We like those better than just naked selling uh, a one or any, any strangle pretty much. So yeah, definitely. I think uh, they always tend to blow out. I don't know if always, but eventually it will catch up with you. We always say that's a strategy that works until it doesn't. Right. And on the days when it doesn't, (laughs) that's when you have to have a plan because those days could leave a mark and all the days you win, you win a little bit, you win a little bit, you lose a ton. It's not exactly a long-term viable 
a strategy. But Brian, this is kind of reminiscent of a question we had not too long ago. I think they were asking then how you structure your your skip strike flies using the at the money straddle rather than the one standard deviation. Here's a guy asking us uh, what we think about using that one standard deviation as effectively the wings or the legs really of effectively a, a naked a naked strangle. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think about that one, Brian? What could go wrong with that? What, right, what could go? What couldn't? What, what could go right is a little bit better question, I think. Um, no, I, if you're looking at the one standard deviation strangle, that just means that you're you're taking the the basic mass, the bell shaped curve, which isn't exactly correct in the options trading world, but they in theory use a bell shaped curve to help set option prices. And that means that most of the time, and by most they define that as 68% of the time, the underlying stock, no matter it, what the management is, no matter what the news is, no matter what industry they, they are, based off of the implied volatility, the underlying stock usually stays within that range 68% of the time. So we're selling a, a put and we're selling a call. We're hoping the stock stays within those strikes if uh, we do this type of trade. And the biggest thing about that is, is that the market isn't, doesn't always work the way that the theory does. So one of the biggest things is if you look at uh, the big days, the big Black uh, Monday or Black Fridays and, and all these big uh, moves that have happened in the marketplace, those, those days there's been five, six, seven, eight standard deviation moves, which in theory should never happen, but in the real world they actually do. So I, I never suggest anybody in the retail space ever go out and just do these trades time and time again. And I think your phrase was perfect there, Mark, when you say they work until they don't. Um, you're always because you by buying uh, a little buying the wings is is what a lot of people will say because we're talking about iron condors and iron butterflies for the cost versus uh, the risk that you remove uh, the value is there to buy the insurance and to buy those wings so if I'm you're, you're thinking about doing it my suggestion would be that you want to lay down until the urge goes away if anything that uh, I think uh, I'd rather do it the opposite way where I wasn't selling it I would just buy them but then you got to have a lot of capital where you just keep buying them over and over again and you wait for that huge one standard deviation move to happen and then you got to have the cojones to stay in long enough. You know, when would you get out if the market is tanking to the downside or taking off to the upside? And you are long that strangle. When would you end up selling it and trying to make the profit? So when it comes to this type of trading where you have these extremes, where you have unlimited risk, you have unlimited upside, they're all they're interesting in theory, but man, it's really hard to do it in practice where you say, okay, if it gets to this striker, if, it, if I'm starting to lose on this trade, I'm just going to close it and get out. But then all of a sudden you wake up one morning and guess what? You didn't get the chance to close and get out because the market gap open. So yeah, always the, the, the value of the insurance, the value you get from buying the wings on these type of strategies is well worth the risk mitigation. I like that. If you're thinking about doing this, just lay down until the urge goes away. <laughs> that's, right. exactly. that's good advice, sir. I think we all, we all could follow that advice to some degree in our lives. All right, let's keep on. Maybe, maybe our next listener should, should heed that advice. This comes from this is Scott, Scott Somer. That name sounds familiar. I think he's written in before. He says, if a calendar is too expensive in Amazon, is the following strategy that he concocted here, is that a legitimate way to the, reduce the cost? And he sends in his example. It looks like he wanted to buy the Aknove, so a one-month 1795 strike calendar in Amazon. Apparently, that was too expensive. And that, that, that's understandable. Amazon, big, high-priced name. The options are pretty pricey. Uh, so he thought he could reduce his outlay by turning around, effectively doing two verticals, by buying that 17. Remember, a calendar listeners, if you're buying it, usually you're buying the longer-term contract, selling the nearer terms. So in this case, he'd be buying the Nove 1795 call and then selling the Ox 1795 call. That's a standard calendar. He wants to add 
a couple of legs to it. He wants to sell the Nove 1855 call, so effectively buying that Nove $60, um, sounds like this around at the money when he did this, so an at the money vertical there, and then turning around and also selling the $60 vertical in October. So selling the 1795 call, buying the 1855 call in October. So effectively doing two 60 handle verticals, one in Nove, one in October versus the straight up calendar. I have to say, I, I don't, I don't see a lot of utility uh, to this approach here. You know, you're, you're selling that one 1855 call. So that's getting you something, but you're buying the Oc one. Granted, the Nove's going to be worth more. So you're getting a little bit more there in premium, but maybe not enough to offset doing all the rest of this and all this. This is almost effectively like an, a bit of an at-the-money box, <laughs> which is not a thing that is done. Boxes obviously are usually done in the money. They're a carry play. So this is a bit of a funky one. He, he adds here, Scott, is there an additional risk to this I'm not seeing? I don't, addition, outside of risk, I don't know, Brian. I just don't see the value, the utility of, of going to all this effort for whatever small nominal amount of premium reduction you're going to get. Does this approach resonate with you, Brian? The, the I guess, effectively, for lack of a better term, the at-the-money vertical calendar as opposed to straight-up calendar? So, so yeah, I, if I look at this, you, you're right. I, I think what has been concocted is either a box or a jelly roll, and I don't remember exactly which one it would be, and I would have to look at it inside an actual uh, profit and loss calculator to come up exactly what's going on here. But ultimately, it looks like you're doing a trade where you're just basically going to end up with the, the maximum you could make is the risk-free interest rate. And uh, when traders did this down on the trading floor, they, that's all it was, was an interest rate play. Now, if you could lean and you could get some decent prices because you were a trader down on the floor and you could buy you know, on the bid and sell on the ask, well, then it may be feasible to try to attempt this trade. But definitely, if you're going to put this all on as one trade and you're going to try to execute this at a benefit to, to yourself, it, it's really not going to work out. And it's just, there's a lot of commissions involved, a lot of headaches. And like I said, I'd, I'd want to throw it into a profit and loss calculator to get, but I'm, I'm just going to say steer clear. <laughs> I don't really see the benefit of all this, but I see you had the same strike. I see uh, that he has the same strikes in this trade on uh, with different expirations. Yeah, I'd, I'd yeah, I would just steer, steer clear. Um, if the, if Amazon is just too expensive overall, just find a different underlying. There's other ones out there, and if you're doing these type of trades, uh, there are just different opportunities in other underlyings uh, that that can have kind of the same volatility. You just want to look at same volatility, try to look at a little bit more expensive stock, but not quite a seventeen hundred dollar stock, and uh, maybe look at the calendars and, the, and those underlyings. I don't like this trade, just flat out, by looking at what's going on here. I think the theme for our episode is if you have these desires, just, just lay down until they go away. <laughs> We're two for two. <laughs> We're two for two on the lay down. That's going to be our advice going forward. Just lay down until the, until the urge passes. Let's see if we're three for three here. Next up, we have Jay. Uh, Jay wants to know. Jay says, hi. Well, hi, Jay. Uh, I love swing trading, but struggling. I have a small account in in I trade op and I think it means and I trade options. Gotta love the uh, the truncated the truncated usage of of characters on social media. So I have a small account and uh, I trade options. Do you recommend thirty delta versus at the money or just trade in the money? Also, two week options versus thirty or sixty days. Thanks. Well, there's a lot packed into this very. Short amount of characters in terms of questions, uh, Jay. Let's see. I mean, this is thematically this is the type of question we receive a lot, which is kind of what is the appropriate use case, or is there an appropriate use case for options when you're doing much more day to day, minute by minute kind of swing trading and scalping, like a futures or a stock guy, the delta one kind of guys usually do. They they always have a hard time wrapping their heads around the proper use case. Uh, for that with options. First off, you say you have a small account, so that's going to give you a little bit of a challenge there. Remember, a lot of the typical use cases for options are, are longer than one day. You could certainly do intraday. It, it's, it's doable. It has been done. It is done 
every day, but a lot of the use cases that come through to it are, are hedging a little bit longer term, maybe generated income a little bit longer term. Remember, there's things like time decay, and these, that, has, that takes time, by definition, for it to make its impact known. So if you're relying on time decay as part of your strategy, that's going to require a little bit of time for that to work out. So not all of these types of strategies you talk about here are utilized very easily in a minute-by-minute kind of scalping type scenario, like, like I assume you're talking about here. So there's a couple of complications. You're trading in the money. Obviously, you're going to get a little more expensive. as more premium allowed. So that might be prohibitive from a small account. But of course, more delta, that's what you're going for here, delta. The more delta you're getting, the better for, for a, uh, you know, someone who's looking to scalp tick by tick like you are. So Brian, there's a lot here in this question, even though it's very short. And also, there's a lot of challenges here because this is a guy who wants to get in there and start slinging and maybe scalp and, and trade minute ticks of the underlying, but he doesn't really have the, the bank role to do it. So what do you recommend? I'm sure you get questions like this a lot. What do you recommend? Maybe you recommend he sticks to a cheap underlying and forget the options altogether. What, maybe he becomes a future scalper. What, what do you think our friend Jay here should do? All right. So you're right. Um, there's a lot to unpack in this. And I think the the Greek that I would talk about is gamma. Now, I'm assuming that Jay is buying options just from the way that he worded the questions here. And uh, the biggest thing is to understand gamma. If I'm looking at at-the-money option contracts and I'm correct on my forecast, I want gamma to work for me. I want gamma to increase or accelerate my delta. And the way that I always approach this when I'm teaching the Greeks to uh, a, a bunch of newbies or even more advanced people, a lot of people just don't understand the concept of gamma, I don't think you ever really need to look at the gamma, quote-unquote, and get, a, get, get that number for that option contract, but you need to understand what it does as expiration approaches. So if I have an at-the-money option contract and you think of delta, and that at-the-money option contract should have a delta fairly close to 50. I don't care if it's a call or if it's a put. If it's at the money, it should be around 50. But if the market goes in the money and there's one day remaining, guess what? That delta's got to go to one. If there's 60 days remaining, that delta's going to go to 55 or 45, depending if it goes up or down. So in other words, it's going to move a lot slower. So to answer your question overall, first of all, we need to know the underlying you're talking about. There's just... You know, this could be a seminar in itself, but understand the concept that if you go out further in time and you are buying option contracts, that's great. It gives you a slower rate of decay, but it also gives you a slower moving option contract. So when you're correct on your forecast, it takes you uh, longer in order for your option to double, if you will, by looking at the, the price of the option contract. Whereas on the shorter term options, well, now you have this huge rate of time decay, but guess what? That delta is explosive and it's really going to move. So what would we recommend? I, unless I know the forecast and what you're looking at, and that's what we do on Options Playbook Radio. As a matter of fact, this actually is a great premise for Options Playbook Radio because that's what we're looking for. We're looking for scenarios where this one strategy that's mentioned in the Options Playbook might fit the underlying for that week, and we talk about why it does. And a lot has to do with how the pricing is on option contracts and how we'd like to do butterflies uh, after earnings. Why? Because if I do a short-term butterfly after earnings and I'm correct on my forecast, I get a huge rate of time decay, and I also get a lot of uh, volatility crunch coming in, which can help if I'm correct on my forecast. So it, it, when you think about swing trading, you got to think about how much time decay there is relative to the gamma, to the explosivenesses of your option contract. And actually, now they use different Greek symbols for it, but there are a lot of option pricing calculators that will actually give you a ratio of gamma versus theta. And they'll call it epsilon, or they'll call it some other Greek letter, but just because you're trying to manage that ratio, and that's one of the hardest things for swing traders to, to know, you know, should I buy a 30, well, should I buy a 30 delta option contract? Well, yeah, you should if you think the stock's going to get there, right? But if you're buying 30 delta, you need that option contract to get in the money. If you don't think it can get at least 50 cents to a dollar in the money when you're doing that type of of trading, then you don't want to buy a 30 delta option contract because time decay is going to kill you. 
so yeah, that that's a loaded question there. Um, I tried my best though. You gotta you gotta appreciate the effort, huh, Mark? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot squeezed into that 250 characters or whatever that is uh, there. Yeah, Jay, if you want to follow up with more specifics about what underlying you're looking at, that that would certainly uh, help us. Uh, it is challenging given the limited amount of data you gave us to really provide you with specifics, particularly because a lot of the techniques people use in that type of space that want to do what you're doing usually are a little bit more capital intensive, whether it's synthetics or deep in the money or things like that, those usually require a little bit more of a bankroll, and it sounds like that's an issue uh, for you. So yeah, write in, give us some more specifics, and we'd be happy to maybe come up with some more uh, tailored ideas. But it is challenging, and as gam- as, Bri- as gamma, I called you gamma, Brian. That's <laughs> like that. As gamma, as Brian alluded to there, the gamma getting your bang for your buck is your is your key focus there. We want to focus on this. So give us some more ideas of what it is you're doing, and maybe we could help give you a little bit more specific guidance. But this is that's an interesting. Maybe that's a good topic for a future playbook, OPR episode, Brian. Using options for smaller time horizons and maybe with smaller accounts, you know? Mm-hmm. When and which option to buy. Yeah. So, man, maybe Jay doesn't have to lay down. His question wasn't bad. <laughs> he can, he's good. I'll tell you what. We're generous. We'll squeeze one more on here onto the show. This one comes from Alto. Alto, he's got a bit of a out-of-left-field one. He, he wants to know, which do you think has a better chance of happening? Uh, no more earnings calls or after-hours options trading? And which do you think would be more impactful for options traders? And do you have a preference? Uh, well, my preference, I think, would clearly be the after-hours options trading here, Alto. I've, I've been beating that drum for a long time. I have chatted about it with Brian. I, whenever I do my my hits down at the OIC conference every year. I'm, I make sure that's a topic I bring up to all of the various exchange leaders and heads of the brokerage firms to put it out there because we get that request all the time. People want to have access to that liquidity. Maybe not fully understanding of all the consequences they're in for doing that, but that is a request we get a lot. So I put it out there. I hear mixed things. I did just very recently actually uh, get reached out to by someone who used to be on one of our shows regularly out of the blue and said he heard some behind the scenes conversations that maybe. All of a sudden, after hours, options trading is getting a little bit more traction out of the blue. So I would have to say, based on the recent scuttlebutt that I heard, the after hours options thing, the no more earnings calls thing, I know what you're referring to. That seemed like that was all the rage about a year ago or so. As I recall, Warren Buffett was behind it, a few other big investors. They said it added to too much market volatility, so they wanted to maybe spread out the calls a little bit. I think even Trump weighed in on it. So it seemed like they have a little bit of muscle, but it seems like... Trump and others have moved on to other things like the, like the trade war of late. We haven't heard much on that front. So I don't think either of these as a, as a, is going to happen anytime soon. But if I had to weigh in on one, I would probably let, weigh in on the after hours options trading. I think that would probably be more impactful for options traders as well because it gives you more access to liquidity. Brian, first off, which of these do you prefer? Would you prefer the after hours trading or earnings calls going away? And which do you think would be more impactful? And also, which do you think has a better chance of happening? Three questions here from Mr. or Mrs. Alto. Well, they've tried after-hours option trading, and they do kind of have it um, in the S&P 500 index in that you can still trade for 15 minutes after the close. But the biggest thing about the after-hours, it's only a 15-minute session, but uh, – about the after hours option trading is that uh, the markets are going to just be extremely wide because if the if the people making the markets and the options don't know exactly what they can buy on the ask and sell on the bid as far as their hedge is concerned with the underlying it, their their bid ask spreads are going to be extremely wide and they've tried it uh, they've uh, they've done a couple of tech test cases i mean a long time ago i recall at the chicago board option exchange the concept just keeps coming back time and time again uh... in this day and age with the advent of all the electronics on the marketplace you know, maybe maybe they can pull it off, but back then it just did not work. The markets were just too wide, and they just couldn't do it. Now, no more earnings calls. I don't. I I just think if I look at that and I think about it, it just gives uh, uh, the concept of them not being forced to tell you what those earnings were for a quarter. I think would be just kind of scary overall. I, I, I think there's a lot of transparency in the earnings call, and I, I would not like to see that by any means. I, I guess I would have to be in a world where that happens. I mean, will they, will they be announcing more often than less often? Instead of doing it once a quarter, they're doing uh, releasing data once a month. Um, 
But I think after hours option trading would be wonderful. Uh, it's just all about the liquidity of the underlying in the after hours. We see many times where companies announce earnings and the stock will go down 10% only to open up the next day 5%. And it's just kind of odd, uh, you know, and, and a lot of that has to do with just the fact that there's just not a ton of people that are being li- that are to add liquidity to that after hours market in the underlying stock, let alone the options. Well said, sir. We'll have to leave it there. Keep those questions coming. So if you too want to join Marival or Scott or Jay or Alto on the program, maybe you have a question you want to feature on OPR. Maybe you want to hit up Brian directly. You can't wait for our next huddle episode, even though they are coming pretty fast and furious of late. But if that's too too far apart for you, you want to get your question asked directly to the options guy himself. Brian, where should they go? What should they do? Yeah, and my e- inbox has been filling up uh, recently, I have to admit. So I guess people uh, have been uh, listening to this email address. It is theoptionsguy at invest.ally.com. That's theoptionsguy at invest.ally.com. And I want to say thanks to you, Mark, for hosting, and thanks to you for listening. We'll be back at the same time, same place next week. Until then, may all the options you bought finish in the money and all the ones you sold finish out. The Options Playbook is brought to you by Ally Invest. Anything mentioned today is for educational purposes and is not a recommendation or advice. Options involve risk. Please refer to ally.com slash invest slash disclosures to review additional risks involved with trading options. Securities offered through Ally Invest Securities, LLC, member FINRA and SIPC. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.